England. Ireland. Scotland. And Wales. The pride of four nations unite as a pride of lions. The British Lions Tour of South Africa and the reigning world champions are waiting for the first squad to make the challenge in 17 years. A pride of Lions is no match for the world champions. Sky Television proudly presents the complete British Lions Tour of South Africa. Over on Sky 2 now, a full moon brings out the wolf in TC. But Chris isn't complaining. Romance rears its head in Pacific Blue. This is Sky 1 Primetime. With an extraordinary account of why planes go down. Hello, I'm Gillian Anderson. I have to tell you, at first I was a little hesitant about hosting this program because I tend to be a nervous flyer. But we hope that the information in this hour will forever change the way that you travel on commercial aircraft. For me, it already has. We all have a lot of questions when it comes to airline travel. Do you ever wonder why they allow unrestrained babies to sit on their parents' lap while you are urged to keep the seatbelt fastened? When your plane starts down the runway in a driving rainstorm, do you find yourself saying, just let this one get in the air? When you go from a big jet to a smaller propeller plane, do you wonder if you are as safe? When we travel by plane, there always seems to be so many questions and nobody with an answer. But in the next hour, you'll get the answers, and many of them will startle you. Let's take a look at reality. These last few months have been trying times for air carriers. Nine serious incidents and four devastating crashes have put aviation safety on the front page. December 20th, an American Airlines flight 965 careens into a Colombian mountain. 160 people perish. February 6th, 189 passengers and crew on a Turkish airline are plunged into shark-infested waters off the Dominican Republic. February 29th, a Boeing 737 crashes and burns in Peru. Again, no survivors. April 3rd, another fatal accident. The military version of the Boeing 737 crashed into a hillside in Croatia, killing 35 people, including Commerce Secretary Ron Brown. As we we're about to find out, any number of things can go wrong when you fly. And when something does, there may be no worse way to die. There was a tremendous explosion in a whirlwind tornado throughout the entire airplane. My first thought was, oh my gosh, this isn't an emergency. It's the worst crisis possible. My first realization, and to be honest, is that you're probably going to die this afternoon. When we hit the water, I felt myself blacking out, and I never expected to regain consciousness. Fathers grabbed for their children, husbands grabbed for their wives. It was absolute stark terror. Over and over, we hear that flying is the safest way to travel. Based on the number of people who fly each year in the U.S., your chances are three million to one that a major carrier or commuter crash will kill you. Those are pretty great odds. But tell that to the hundreds of passengers who went down on these devastated planes. When you as a passenger hand that ticket to the flight attendant and take your seat in the rear of one of those airplanes, you are absolutely, totally, 
out of control of your future and your fate. You totally turn over responsibility for your life or your death to the hands of the airlines and their pilots. The airline industry says we have nothing to worry about. But when we talk to aviation experts, the safety picture that airlines paint doesn't look so rosy. The more you know, the more you're aware of what's going on, the better you will be able to comprehend it and realize what you should be afraid of and what you shouldn't be afraid of. In Collision Course, a book Ralph Nader co-authored on airline safety, he says safety often takes a back seat to airline economics and government politics. Aviation safety is like a rubber band. You know, the, the risks increase and nothing happens. The risks increase and nothing happens. And then at some point, snaps. We don't want to get to that point. As we get into the future, we're going to see accidents happening almost every week in our newspapers, major catastrophes. When I regained consciousness, we were sinking, and the water in the aircraft was about up to my nose. I was engulfed in the flames, and I, I knew that I was in fire. Everything that wasn't tied down was airborne. It was as loud as laying under a train on a track when the train's going over. You couldn't hear yourself scream. Once you hit the ground, you literally have seconds before the, the cabin is engulfed in this thick smoke. And, and when I say thick, you can barely see your hand in front of your face, and you can't breathe. I was in intensive care. I almost died the first night. My wife and son, youngest son, got there, and I said, what about everybody else? And her big blue eyes filled up with tears, and she, she started to cry. She said, not everybody made it. These people all lived through the absolute horror of a crash. But what went wrong? Why couldn't they beat the odds? Why did their planes go down? Up the ramp they go. This trip is going to be fun. The motors are starting. Fasten seat belts. Look, we're starting to take off. And then up, up into the air. We'd all like to think flying on an airliner is one big joyride. But it's essential that everyone around that plane works as a team. If any one person makes a mistake, it can be the beginning of the end. Clear to go, Northwest. Northwest Flight 255 started out like just about any other. It was 1987, a clear August day in Detroit. A plane load of passengers was urged to quickly take their seats. The pilots may have been in a rush to get the MD-80 jet into the air. One reason could be the 11 p.m. noise curfew at Southern California's John Wayne Airport, their final destination. So far, that's approved. The pilots started down the runway unaware their wing flaps weren't down. That meant this plane had no chance of flying. and 56 people died, including four infants, as the plane clipped light poles, smashed into a rental car building, and burst into flames on the freeway. And he just started banking left and right. There's this big wall of fire. The chief cause of accidents continues to be human error, very often crew error in the cockpit. Tim Neal is a spokesman for the Air Transport Association, which represents the major air carriers. Airlines don't like to see their planes go down in flames. Some of those problems are difficult to solve when you're talking about human failure. You know, why did somebody screw up? Why did they forget to do something? Uh, why did they compound the error? The key new thing I think that we're going to see in the years ahead is the monitoring of pilot performance during flight, an analysis of that so we can see where we need to do some more work. Many studies say that more than six out of ten crashes are primarily the fault of the flight crew, the people flying the plane. According to the National Transportation Safety Board report, the probable cause of that Northwest tragedy was the failure to perform some of the most basic cockpit procedures. But only a year later, it happened again. Same problem, different airport. This time in Dallas, three pilots of Delta 1141 also forgot to set their flaps because they were chatting with a flight attendant. In this ironic twist, the black box recording foreshadows the tragedy to come. Okay. 
discuss about the dating habits of our flight attendants so we could get it on the recorder, you know, in case we crashed and the media would have some kind of a juicy oh, tidbit. Oh, is that right? Oh, is that what they're looking for? Yeah, you know, that Continental that crashed in Denver? Mm -hmm. Did you read that? No, I didn't. Yeah, they were talking about the dating habits of one of the flight attendants. I mean, we got to leave something for our wife and children to listen to. Power set. Boeing 727 hit the ground tail first and erupted in a fireball. 13 people died. All three pilots survived. What we've just seen is two cases of serious pilot error. But sometimes it's the skill and determination of a good pilot that's responsible for saving the lives of many passengers. There's no better example of that than United Airlines Flight 232. On 232, we were flying along on this beautiful July Wednesday afternoon, uh, the last day of a four-day trip for our crew. Jan Brown Lohr was a flight attendant on the DC-10 jet. She was heading home to Chicago July 19, 1989. And just out of the blue, this loud explosion which was our number two engine. The uh, cockpit announcement was we had uh, shut down the number two engine and would be a few minutes late arriving at O'Hare. United Captain Denny Fitch began his journey as a passenger on flight 232. Just outside of Sioux City, Iowa, the back engine exploded, cutting off all steering controls. The pilots were suddenly flying a plane that was in layman's terms, like a car with no steering wheel and no brakes. The wide-body jet could fly on the remaining engines, but it couldn't be controlled and it couldn't land. Denny Fitch got out of his seat and went to the cockpit on a mission. What he saw was a captain and his crew in a life-or-death struggle. And I said, would you like me to do the throttles? To which he agreed, and uh, for the next 30 minutes, I began my own research uh, laboratory. And I was ready to die if necessary. The next thing that came to my mind was a flight instructor I had years ago. And he basically taught me, never give up. Never, ever give up. And so with that mindset, I went to work for the next 30 minutes and tried to tame the beast. We had several infants sitting on laps. So I came back on the PA and made the announcement that parents with lap children placed them on the floor, positioned them on the floor at this time. As I was saying it, I, I thought, this is so absurd. I can't believe that this is what we're doing. The following is an animated dramatization of the DC-10 crash using the actual black box recording and pilot dialogue. The runway was in our sights. Uh, we had it lined up. Uh, we were traveling so fast, we were traveling 250 miles an hour. <laughs> Get control of this airplane. We're going to put it down wherever it happens to be. He's coming down real fast. Okay, all right, let's go. Whatever he does, fire. You could not have imagined how hard we hit. Miraculously, 184 people lived through this unbelievable crash. Of the 112 people who didn't make it, one was the two-year-old boy that had been placed on the floor. The first person Jan Brown Lore saw outside the wreck was the boy's stricken mother. She just looked up at me and said, you told me to put my baby on the floor, and I did, and he's gone. And I thought, I'll have to live with that for the rest of my life. The people I think about every morning when I step out of the shower and I see the scars on my body, and I think about both survivors and those that died. The 112 are in one seat, and the 184 that lived are in the other. And at all costs, I have to keep both seats out of the dirt every day. Some days are better than others, that's all. United lost one in, in Sioux City, and the, and the pilot saved a lot of lives, landed an airplane that had no control capability whatsoever. 
The amazing thing is when they put all the instructors and the test pilots in the simulator and duplicated it, they all crashed and they couldn't do that. It's an amazing thing. Coming up later in the program, the showdown over child safety seats that might have saved the life of little Evan Sow. What would you tell your loved ones if you had only moments to live? Next, the letter one man wrote on his way down. Friday at 8, a new episode of Jack. When royalty commands, I obey. An unruly princess needs babysitting. Show her a big ship. Girls like that. But she has something else in mind. What are you doing here? I came to spend the night. Then at 9, Chuck's on the hunt for missing children. There's only one reason those children were taken. It's for ransom. You're probably right. In a brand new episode. You got 24 hours. Jack and Walker, Texas Ranger, Friday on Sky One. Just because we get around Talking about my generation Things ain't do look awful Talking about my generation I hope I die before I get old Living in exile is not an easy thing. You dream of coming home, but I never dreamt of this. Where there's no justice, you come up with the money, or you bury your brother. There can be no peace. Where can I find my brother? Ice Cube, Dangerous, dangerous ground. ground. Having a baby is the best thing that ever happened to me, so that's probably why I tried it again and again <laughs> and again. But you never stop worrying about their health. Even their skin is so delicate, so near perfect. Even a tiny little bit of moisture can lead to irritation. And when that moisture is urine in his nappy, it can't be very good for his skin. I've used Pampers for all four of my children. It keeps their skin dry, so it helps keep it healthy. Pampers have the Ultra Plus Core, so there's no drier nappy. For skin to stay healthy, it helps to be dry. And Finn is such a sunny child, I know that Pampers is doing its job. When you've got a happy family, you can't ask for much more. Healthy skin starts with dry skin. The driest Pampers ever. For drier, happier babies. Mm, personal natural extracts. I smell orange. I smell rosemary. I smell eucalyptus. And I smell a rat. Body Form Invisible has an ultra-reliable anti-leak system to help keep everything away from the sides, so you can do whatever you want. I was admiring the fingertip controls of my Vectris CD player when... Take me to the old chemical works. My clock keeps packing a piece, so I don't argue. I turn on my Vectra's new navigational gizmo, the car in. Turn right. It says. My ABS cuts in when I see some cops. And while he eats carpet, I change the route. This is a shortcut, I tell him. <laughs> but not to where he wants to go. Preview of the Kleenex for Men Tissues movie presentation. Ultra-nationalist leader Vladimir Rachenko denounced the U.S. pressure as an act of war. The Cold War may be a memory. Maybe it's not as bad as it looks. But the missiles still wait under the waves. It is. There's trouble in Russia. They called us. We're here to preserve democracy, not to practice it. Now, miles from home. Seal a goddamn bay before we all go to hell. In the deep, vast middle of the sea. There will be a nuclear holocaust beyond imagination. A fearful decision has been demanded. This is the captain. The release of nuclear weapons has been authorized. The unthinkable is unfolding. This is not a drill. Armageddon is once more just a shot away. Torpedoes in the water, Barry. Zero, four, eight. Mr. Hunter. I'm captain of this boat. I've made a decision. We cannot launch our missiles unless both you and I agree. Arrest this man captain and get him out of here! Gene Hackman. Give me the missile key, Mr. Hunter. Denzel Washington. Snapshot two and four. Now, I want... Tony Scott's Crimson Tide premieres Saturday at 10 on the Movie Channel. Ever been to an antique air show? Go to any major airport, because airlines in the U.S. have the oldest fleets of planes in the Western world. Did you know the average age of a Boeing 727 that's still flying is over 22 years old? That's the average. 
The 727 you fly tomorrow could be 30 years old. That means it was made in 1966. Aloha Flight 243 was an old plane that was flown one too many times. Suffering from metal fatigue, Aloha 243 finally gave way, exploding in mid-air. A huge section of the roof ripped off the jet. Thinking he was about to crash, passenger Bob Nichols quickly scrawled this goodbye note to his family on an in-flight magazine. Overhead blown out, rows one through nine. Many missing pieces. You can see sky and, and clouds. Aircraft turbulent, going down fast. Appears cockpit may be gone. No word from pilots. Don't know when hit. Ground going in. I love you, Jan. I love, I love Jenny, Shane, Robert. No time left. Love, Dad. Amazingly, Bob Nichols and 88 other passengers survived that heart-stopping tragedy. I think people are entitled to know how old the aircraft that they're traveling in is and how many departure and arrival landings there have been in order to determine whether these aging aircraft should be retired by the uh, airline companies. Air travel can only be as safe as the plane itself. And for most of us, it's a marvel these metallic dinosaurs can even get off the ground. Industry giant Boeing has been having a bumpy ride lately. Since December, the reliable 757 has had two ghastly accidents. And the 737, the most popular two-engine commercial jet in history, is suspect after two unsolved catastrophes. We have two accidents presently, Colorado Springs and Pittsburgh, both involving the same type of aircraft. NTSB Chairman Jim Hall runs the agency charged with pinpointing the cause of every crash and then recommending safety policies. I'm not satisfied that uh, the 737 is still flying today and we have not had implementation of the recommendations out of the Pittsburgh crash. In the Pittsburgh and Colorado Springs crashes, both 737s went down in clear weather, just dropped out of the sky. The death toll, 157 people. And then since February, another two crashes. A 737 went down in Peru, killing 123. And our country mourned the loss of some of its brightest leaders when a military version of the 737 went down on April 3rd, killing all on board. Boeing declined our request for an interview, but we did speak with David Hinson, head of the FAA. He has the authority to ground a plane if it's deemed unsafe. If you take all of the flight hours and all of the accidents, it's still one of the very safest airplanes in the air, so it's safe. Investigators still don't know why the 737s are going down. And here's another case of a plane still flying where they do know why it's crashed. The ATR-72. For some, not enough is being done to fix this plane. It is a devastating scene. Uh, there is a small crater uh, there, and the, the wreckage is strewn in a fairly uh, close radius around uh, the impact site. Massive destruction of this. Halloween, 1994. 64 passengers board American Eagle Flight 4184 and fly into a freezing Midwest rainstorm. If only they'd been informed that their plane, an ATR-72, has a history of problems in icy weather. Many of those people, maybe all of them, might have gotten off the ill-fated flight. The following is a dramatization using actual flight data and pilot transcripts from Flight 4184. Low Eagle, uh, Flight 184, uh, should be about 10 minutes until you cleared in. No, I can double check on that. Just sent a message to dispatch. And uh, 10 more minutes, she said. Whoa! How do we do that? I'm trying to keep it at 180. Oh. Whoops! <laughs> okay. <sighs> man. Oh. Oh. No, it's okay. Uh, it's all right, man. Okay, mellow it out. After the crash, some pilots actually walked off the job rather than fly the ATR-72 in icy conditions. Steve Frederick is one of the pilots who lost his job. 
this is not going to happen again. If I lose my career, the truth would come out about the ATR. The problem with the ATR-72 is ice. It builds up on the wings. The plane can then nosedive towards the ground, as it did in two crashes and a number of close calls. We were almost instantaneously confronted with an aircraft that went from perfectly flyable, perfectly controllable, right on the beam, to a, an aircraft that was almost out of control and was trying to, frankly, kill us. The FAA did ground the planes in bad weather. But the manufacturer added larger de-icing boots and did some additional testing. Now you can again fly an ATR-72 in the worst weather conditions. Here's the ticket to prove it. The same route taken during the devastating crash in Roselawn, Indiana. But is the plane safe? That airplane is very safe today. Because of some data that we were able to collect as a result of the accident in Indiana, it's just fine. The FAA evaluated that, said that looks good to us, and they allowed the airplane to go back into service. Um, at this point, we don't know if those boots are actually a permanent fix. As long as the ticket agents give them the go-ahead to get on that airplane, passengers get on them without a second thought. And I think that people should start having second thoughts, take a look at where they are placing their behinds. And while we're at it, we should watch where we're landing. Another factor in the risk equation is the safety of the airport. Pilots uh, look at LaGuardia in New York as a real challenging airport. Uh, they say that you need a sort of a fighter pilot mentality to come into LaGuardia because there's a, a steep angle of approach and there's short runways and Flushing Bay is sitting right at the end of the runways. We're slowly coming down in altitude. We're having to make these turns right around all these buildings, monuments. Another difficult approach is Washington, D.C.'s National Airport, rated the most challenging by pilots in a Condé Nast poll. It's very unusual because you're coming down this river and you're looking out over here for the airport, following visual points on the ground, and your attention is really diverted away from flying the airplane. At many airports, including National and John Wayne in Orange County, California, Local regulations are in place to reduce jet noise. Okay, as we come up to 1,500 feet, reduce thrust to the minimum available for a level flight. Yeah, 1,500 feet. Which hopefully will reduce the noise. That changes the way a pilot can fly the plane. At John Wayne, steep angles for takeoffs and landings create a wild ride. National and John Wayne, they're by far the worst. They're an accident looking for a place to happen. We pull back the thrust of the engine to reduce the noise. Now, no pilot really likes to do that. We have to ask ourselves, is a quiet neighborhood more important than passenger safety? The problem that I have is everybody wants electricity, but nobody wants the power company in their backyard. When you get on an airplane, you'd like to walk five minutes to the airport instead of drive an hour. But is convenience more important than safety? It seems like commuter airports are everywhere. And guess what? They're not as safe as you might think. They can be tricky for landings and sometimes lack the latest safety equipment. Also, they're often serviced by commuter airlines with the most questionable planes and the least experienced pilots. We've had a rash of commuter accidents. You've probably seen or flown a commuter before. The small planes make convenient short jumps to smaller cities. But what you probably didn't know is that the crash rate of commuter airlines is twice that of larger commercial jets. And don't be fooled by names like United Express or Delta Connection. Commuter airlines are not necessarily owned, operated, or overseen by major airlines. We did uh, hearings on, on uh, commuter airline safety a few years ago. I mean, I had uh, any number of pilots who wanted to talk to me privately in my office, on the telephone, you know, in a, in a parking lot somewhere to tell me that this is a disaster waiting to happen. Commuter and regional airlines often hire entry-level pilots with less training and less experience than major carriers. They're being paid less than, uh, you know, taxi drivers in many cases. Uh, they're uh, required to have fewer hours of training than a beautician in the state of Oregon. Uh, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. Recognizing the problem, the FAA is planning to unveil sweeping new regulations that it hopes will increase commuter airline safety. Next up, 
You may be surprised to learn just how unsafe your child can be on an airplane. But first, the plain truth about United 811. In 1989, the 747 had climbed to 23,000 feet when a faulty cargo door became loose, blowing out a 20-foot hole in the plane. Nine people flew into the night sky. At least one went directly into the turbine engine. Bruce Lampert was one of the lucky passengers who survived. United 811 was every air passenger's worst nightmare. It could be your nightmare. That same United jet is back, flying passengers over the Pacific. We found that repaired 747 at San Francisco International Airport, certified to fly. Would you buy a ticket? This summer, Britain takes on the world. Rugby Union, the British Lions tour of South Africa. Cricket, England v. the Australians, the One Day Internationals. Football, Le Tournoi. England, Italy, France and Brazil. Rugby League, the World Club Championship, including the Australians. Golf. Britain's best in the US PGA and the US Open take on Tiger Woods. Tennis, Tim Henman in the US Open. The only place to see Britain take on the world this summer is Sky Sports. You'll see it all. Life is all about priorities. Magnum from Walls. There is a better way to relieve constipation. Senecot. For a cream you have with Emax New Spatula, you can remove it much faster. In that leaves your skin really smooth. New Duo Perfect from Emax. There's delicious, juicy flavor just bursting to be set loose from every main art original wine gum. All you've got to do is chew! Mom, there's juice loose about this house. Set the juice loose! The makers of the Naked Gun are about to teach you a lesson. They open like this. You'll never forget. Most of the boys I know just want to stare at girls' breasts. You know what I mean? Sorry, what? John Lovitz. And the next stop. We don't stop in this neighborhood. High School High. This is a BT Easy Reach messenger. So small, you can always carry it with you. Caesar! Does not One of these <laughs> makes sending a message as reliable as delivering it yourself, wherever it needs to go. Easy Reach covers 98% of the UK population. The battery lasts for weeks. It'll even vibrate discreetly. You can send romantic messages or important messages. BT Easy Reach. You'll get the message. Sunday. What the hell is this? Made it! Made it! Open your mind. I think Max was abducted, sucked right out of the store at 29,000 feet. To the possibility. We need to know everything that you know. About what? About Max. That extraterrestrials. Are you accusing these men of covering evidence? Really do exist. There's still no explanation for what brought this plane down. Someone has got to figure out what happened. A brand new X-Files, Sunday at 9, followed by Millennium on Sky One.
would have to fly a flight every day for over 5,000 years to be assured statistically of being in a fatal accident. That statistic may be true based on the sheer numbers of passengers flying, but look at this map. Each dot is an aircraft flying over the United States. There are thousands of planes in the air at any given time. Somewhere in the world, there's an engine fire, emergency landing, or near miss almost every single day. So why do planes go down? Can it be fixed? The head of the FAA, David Hinson, thinks so. He's publicly declared a goal of zero accidents. I do believe that we can reach zero accidents for extended periods of time and probably somewhere out in the future get to zero accidents. I really believe that can happen. Representing the major air carriers is Tim Neal. The zero accident rate is a very, very lofty goal. There's no doubt about that, uh, because it means that you're going to have to eliminate all human error. And there's, there's severe weather conditions, too, that are, that are unforeseen in many cases. Tonight, a sudden but severe thunderstorm. A jumbo jet was carrying 160. Delta Airlines. The type of accident the industry hopes to avoid is Delta Flight 191. The 1985 crash was an imperfect combination of human error and extreme weather that brought a plane raining down from the sky. It was pouring down real hard. We seen lightning strike, but we don't know if it hit the plane or not. It's also become an example of how the government and industry came together to help prevent similar tragedies. Landing check complete. OK, thank you. This stuff is moving in. We're going to get our airplane washed. Well, we've got lightning uh, to the right there, Bill. Yeah, Where I see lightning coming? coming out of that one straight in front of us. What? There's lightning coming out of that one. Where? Right ahead of us. As the Lockheed L-1011 descended below 1,000 feet, the pilots flew into an enormous black storm cloud. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Okay, we're losing airspeed. But... I don't know. I don't know if this is stable. Oh, okay, there you go. Push it up. Way up. Push it up. Way up. The crew didn't know they were caught in treacherous wind shear conditions until it was too late. Push it up, Max. Way up. The plane clipped a car on a freeway, then skidded onto the airfield, exploding in flames. Since this horrific tragedy, the FAA has installed detection radar in several airports and in many planes. Also established, mandatory pilot training for wind shear. But the question remains, why did it take an accident to make the improvements? FAA critics say the agency often has to count tombstones before they act. The FAA is a dinosaur bureaucracy with a very primitive nervous system. If you hit it in the nose in January, the tail moves in December. The only thing that motivates that primitive bureaucracy called the FAA is blood. Many, many instances have been documented where the FAA has identified a problem. They put together a study group to analyze the problem. They work with the industry to try to solve the problem. And while that committee is meeting and pouring coffee and eating donuts, an accident happens and people are killed. As soon as those people are killed and that blood has been spilt, then the FAA issues a change, a modification or a rule that solves the problem. But the only thing that seems to motivate the FAA in this country is when people die. That's exactly what some air traffic controllers are saying about the petrifying breakdowns and blackouts of their antiquated system. It absolutely reduces the margin of safety. We shouldn't have to wait until we have a mid-air collision to say that was unsafe. If they don't deal with the critical breakdowns of the air traffic control system, all it takes is 
one or two mid-air collisions between two large airliners, and we will have the worst aviation death toll in American history. Clear at 3, 451 approved. I don't know that it is criminal, but at best it's immoral what has happened in this country in the air traffic control system. It's just a, it's a disgrace, absolute disgrace. These IBM 9020Es are the equipment controlling air traffic at Chicago Center, the world's busiest air corridor. The technology is so old that a 15-foot bank of the old IBMs have less power than this tiny computer chip. The bulky mainframe computers have so many outdated parts that it's nearly impossible to find technicians trained to fix them. To be perfectly honest with you, the system is strained that it seems from coast to coast. Radar has failed in Tampa, Atlanta, Phoenix, Los Angeles, Seattle, Pittsburgh, Washington. It is a coast-to-coast -coast epidemic of 30 and 40-year-old equipment which is failing. It is true that there are parts of this system that are old and need to be replaced. It is also true that the FAA has been slow and not managed as well as it should have been in the context of some parts of the air traffic control system. But it is unfair and inaccurate to indict the whole system because some parts of it have not been managed in terms of modernization. We shouldn't have to be in the foxhole this long without a supply plane. We need help. The air traffic system is a complicated problem, but at last the FAA is making great strides to fix it. But there is another problem, one that needs only common sense to solve. I am a mother of a young child, and this really strikes a chord with me. Why do we continue to allow infants to fly without being restrained in child safety seats? We bolt down the coffee pots, put away the glasses, tuck your uh, carry-on bag under the seat in front of you securely, but just hold your baby on your lap. And I think a lot of passengers think, well, gee, if the airline tells me it's okay and the government tells me okay, it must be safe. In the last 15 years, 48 million infants have flown in their laps to and under in laps of parents in the United States. There have been 10 fatalities, as I recall. I, I think I'm correct. Maybe eight of those were non-survivable in any case. Two may have survived in child restraint systems, but only may have. There's no absolute proof. Here's a woman who saw one of those babies just before he died. Flight attendant Jan Brown Lohr believes she has proof the child could have been saved. Little Evan Sow was traveling to Chicago on his mother's lap. During emergency landing preparations for United Flight 232, the boy was placed on the floor. This is standard procedure just before a crash. When the plane hit the ground, Evan shot off like a missile, 15 rows across the plane. Two children went off that way. One was very, very fortunate. An overhead bin opened, and she flew into it, and it shut and saved her life. But the other little boy, the 22-month-old boy, was not as fortunate. If we were to mandate child safety seats, we would push millions of people back into their automobiles with their children. I've heard people say, well, who wouldn't buy a seat for their children? A lot of people. A lot of people cannot afford that extra money who fly today. It is simply not safe, and I cannot fathom just hanging it all on finances. To me, when I see children sitting on laps, it's a game of Russian roulette. You probably will be lucky. But I am here to tell you, I came face to face with a woman who lost. Ready for trial, Your Honor. This is no hotshot law firm. The landlord is threatening to evict us again. This is the practice. Anybody here who didn't do it, I'm shocked. These lawyers are fighting for justice. If you think it's tough defending the guilty, try the innocent. In the real world. If you don't turn into a fighter, you are going to be a doormat in this town. From the makers of L.A. Law. Do you know what you're in for? I think so. Do you? The Practice, a brand new series, tonight at 10 
on Sky One. These girls just want to have fun. Yeah! Now they're taking America by storm. It's so it's amazing. The Spice Girls perform live on The Late Show with David Letterman. Thursday night at 11 on Sky Two. No. Card door, strawberry ice cream from Walls. It captures all the fresh, delicate taste of real strawberries. Just ask any strawberry lover. Cart door with real pieces of strawberry. Cart door, tasting is believing. Hello, Auntie. All set for your interview. I really wanted to wear this, but look, it's so delicate. What can I do? Bleach will fix it. What? Bleach will ruin it. Don't worry. It's a gentle bleach called Ace. It's not like normal bleaches. It's for all your laundry, even delicate things like this. Cover the stain, but don't let it dry. Pop the rest in the machine with your detergent, and away you go. Wow. Ace job. Let's hope it leads to an ace job for you. New Ace, the safest type of bleach for all your laundry, even delicates. To him, Caesar means more than a tasty meal cooked in its own tray. Much more. It means you care. Caesar, to love him like he loves you. Hello, I'm Jack Doherty, and if you tune into Transponder 63, you'll see Channel 5 in fabulous new non fuzzy satellite vision. Hi, I'm supposed to test the all new improved Corsa. Fascinating. You missed a spot, so I said to Voxel, only at the Grand Prix circuit in Monte Carlo, or I ain't showing. Boom. Drive. Voxel say Corsa has an improved chassis engineered by Lotus, so it's more comfortable to drive, quieter, and holds corners better than ever. Well, that all works. And now we'll test my chassis and dangerous curves. The new Corsa from Vauxhall, the small car with the big personality. Sky News is Britain's only 24-hour television news service with headlines every 15 minutes. So when the big story breaks, you'll see it immediately, and we'll stay with it for as long as it takes. News when you want it, 24 hours a day, every 15 minutes. Sky News. You'll hear this a lot from passengers. They say, well, if I'm in a plane crash, my number's up. But that's not true. That's one of the biggest myths in air travel today. About 80% of accidents involve forces that your body can withstand. That means 80% of accidents are survivable. This program has changed the way I'll fly from now on. The most important lesson I've learned is how to be a survivor. You can improve your odds of surviving a survivable accident if you know what to do and you know how to get out. Geraldine Frankowski now heads up the Aviation Consumer Action Project after surviving the terror of U.S. Air Flight 1493. Touching down in Los Angeles, the 737 landed on top of a commuter plane and burst into flames. Scott Vaughn also survived that crash. By the time we had skidded down the runway and hit the building, the, the, the plane was completely engulfed and there was mad chaos. Out of the survivable airline accidents, the 79% of the people that die, the majority of them die from smoke inhalation. The more you breathe it, the worse your chances of surviving are. For the last 14 years, Charlie Chittam has been improving crash survivability with tests like these, conducted at the Civil Aero Medical Institute in Oklahoma City. I'd say the three most important factors to getting you off an aircraft in a state of distress are speed and speed and speed. Every time you fly, follow these five essential steps recommended by aviation safety experts. Here's number one. There is no safest seat. 
Every crash is different. However, your best bet is an aisle seat on or near an exit row. When I settle in an aircraft, I sit in the center of the aircraft at an overweighing exit, and that is structurally the strongest part of the aircraft, probably the last part of the aircraft to disintegrate in an accident. It's also essential to count the rows to all the nearest exits. In an accident, you may not be able to see the exits and will have to feel your way, row by row, out of the plane. On takeoffs and landings, pull your seatbelt low and tight, so tight it may even hurt a little. The reason is to avoid what experts call submarining. That'll cause you to slide right down through the belt while it's tied. It could catch you under the shoulders here and dislocate your shoulders. If you slide through there, it could catch you under the neck and break your neck. If you're one of the jaded flyers who ignores the pre-flight safety briefing and information cards, that could be a big mistake. I do this for a living. And before I fly on any airplane, before the aircraft ever leaves the jetway, I've probably read that briefing card 10 times. If you read and train and read and train and read and train, when the situation arises, you can get up and do it just like that, no problem. Most importantly, don't take your carry-on bag when you have an evacuation. I was just at a cabin safety conference and I heard of a precautionary evacuation at Kennedy where a fellow came down the slide carrying a stuffed swordfish. I don't own a material possession worth losing my life over, and I'm quite sure that you don't own one worth killing me over. And finally, what we wear on a plane could help us survive a fire. I would recommend wearing natural type fabrics. Keep as much as you're exposed skin covered as possible. Wool and cotton with tight weaves retard fire. No shorts, no high heels. Wear hard sole lace-up shoes so they won't slide off on impact. You may need shoes to run through glass, twisted metal, and even burning fuel. If you had a bushy head of hair and you had hairspray on it, and one of those little molten polycarbons of fire came down and hit you on the head, you'll get an instant haircut. And here's something all women need to remember. Never wear pantyhose or nylon stockings on a flight. Pantyhose, nylon stockings and things like that have a very low melting point. And if you start generating heat, they could melt on your skin and create severe burns on your skin. We conducted a test on pantyhose to demonstrate how quickly they melt and burn in the type of flash fire often encountered in a crash. Within seconds, the stockings fuse to the simulated latex skin of the mannequins. Flight attendant and crash survivor Jan Brown Lore is all too familiar with this phenomenon. My nylons were the most lethal piece of clothing on my body. They melted to my skin. I had second and third degree burns on my ankles. Those nylons were deadly and they are very painful. The irony is that most airlines require female flight attendants to wear nylon stockings as part of their uniform. Once again, the five tips that may save your life. Ask for an aisle seat near an exit row and count the seat backs all the way to the exits. Buckle up tight and always keep your seatbelt on during a flight. Pay attention to all of the safety instructions. Dress properly for flights. And remember, in an emergency, save yourself, not your baggage. Every single one of these five safety steps is something that we as passengers have control over. We don't have to be afraid of flying, just prepared. It's a very safe way to travel, but safety is really a dynamic thing. Just as aircraft technology and traffic patterns are changing, safety is something that requires constant vigilance. What's safe today isn't safe tomorrow. The whole safety of these systems will depend on how informed and how demanding airline passengers are. Passengers own the system. They pay for everything, from air traffic control down to the runways. And so they really should feel entitled and, in some sense, obligated to participate in the system and demand the highest level of safety. When we started this program, we asked a simple question. Why do planes go down? What we've learned is that there are no simple answers to this complex issue. But we do hope this program is opening some eyes about air travel. Our purpose is not to discourage anyone from flying, but to encourage everyone, including the airlines, to fly safer. We've already heard from the experts, but here's our own personal list of safety tips. 
When you book a ticket, know what kind of plane you're flying. Know when to fly. If possible, avoid heavy traffic times, congested airports, and bad weather. Look carefully at safety and maintenance records of airlines. You may have to dig a little on this one, but it's very important. Ask your travel agent, read magazines, write your congressman if that's what it takes. Demand answers. After all, your safety should be your priority. I'm Jillian Anderson. Thanks for watching. And Gillian Anderson investigates a suspicious plane crash in the X-Files on Sunday. Next Tuesday, on a somewhat lighter note, we look at funny wedding disasters, but more of that in just a moment, after which we head for Boston to join Bobby Donald's practice. disasters. Catch the worst moments from the happiest days of their lives. This will something you'll never forget. Blushing brides, dashing grooms, family and guests show you their funniest moments caught on tape. To be my lawful wedded wife. To be The world's funniest wedding disasters next Tuesday at 9 on Sky One.